In March of 2003, when I was 17, my younger brother and I took a weekend camping trip to the Los Padres National Forest. We had gone there many times with our family for day camping, swimming and just lounging around. This time though, we went alone for a two night camping trip at our favourite spot that most locals simply called the Gorge. We will never forget this weekend for all the wrong reasons. We got there Saturday morning at around 9am and hiked the 5 miles out to the gorge. The gorge is a large swimming hole with a huge 60 foot rock cliff boulder that visitors love to jump from into the deep water below. The jumping rock cliff is very steep and one must jump in a specific location below to ensure that they do not hit the rocks protruding from the wall face. The gorge has many primitive camping areas and is overall a beautiful yet isolated place. The first day was very fun and after a long day of swimming, catching crayfish, jumping from rocks and just relaxing, we set up our tent, made a fire and ate our cans of spaghettios and the few crayfish we had cooked for dinner. Towards the end of dinner, we were visited by a large group of students who were camping further down the river. They stated that there were students from the Bay Area who had a few nights left in their almost two week long school camping trip. We offered them some of our chips and snacks and chatted a bit with them before they made their hike back up to their camping spot. It soon got dark and my brother and I got ready for bed. My brother was two years younger than I and had a deep fear of isolation so we slept in the same tent and agreed that we would keep our fire burning the entire night to ease his anxiety. We put five large logs in the fire and crept inside our tent and got into our sleeping bags. We both fell asleep very fast as we were exhausted from the day. Around 2.30 in the morning, we were both awoken by a large splash of water near our tent that put out our fire. We heard no voices and could not see much from inside our tent. We froze in terror. My brother began to cry and I tried to calm him down. I told him that I would go outside to investigate and that everything would be okay. I told him that our water bladder must have fell from the tree where we had hung it and that I'm sure it was some kind of a coincidence. I grabbed my flashlight and zipped our tent and stepped outside. I pointed the flashlight over to the fire pit and saw four large men sitting around our fireplace, all staring at me with what I can only describe as expressionless faces. It appeared as though they had split open our two gallon water bladder that we had hanging over a tree and had thrown it into our fire. I was in shock and didn't know what to say. For about five seconds, none of them said anything. We just stared at each other. Then, one of them said in a very drunk voice, Get your pussy friend out here. I then heard my brother hyperventilating and screaming and crying in our tent in a way that made me feel so helpless. I had no weapons and my brother and I were outnumbered two to one. I asked the men what they wanted and told them that we would just leave and that we were sorry if we had taken their camping spot or invaded their area. They ignored my question and just stood up. That is when I saw the two of the four men were holding something in their hands. A long sword shaped in appearance like a machete or a small sword but they looked homemade and very primitive. The men yelled at us to get up and to bring our pussy asses with them. I thought for a second that these might be drunk rangers getting mad at us for having too big of a fire, but once I glanced at their clothing and saw their baggy jean pants and their black and grey hoodie type clothing, I knew we were not that lucky. I had heard in the past that drunk dealers or the Mexican cartel had been caught hiding large amounts of marijuana plants in the forest and wondered if these men were some of those men who somehow felt that we were a threat to their crops. I was in fear for our lives. The men did not touch us or directly threaten us with violence but I definitely felt an implied threat in their tone and believed that we really had no choice in the matter. My brother who was still crying and I followed the lead male while the other three men fell back behind us. My brother put his hand on my shoulder and was obviously shaking. He then whispered to me that they were walking in the direction of the 60 foot plus rock cliff and that we needed to run. 
I was petrified and had not been paying attention to where they were leading us, but realized that he was right. I stopped dead in my tracks and said to the men, What are you going to do to us? The lead male stated in a slurred voice, Nothing, we're just going to have some fun with you pussies. I felt that we really had no choice but to do what they said and hoped that they were merely screwing with us and that this would be all over soon. After about 30 seconds of walking, we arrived at the jumping spot on top of the boulder overlooking the gorge swimming area. One of the men then stated, Have you guys ever jumped from here? I told them that yes, I had, but my brother had not, as it was a pretty high jump and was very dangerous for most people due to the height and the rocks below. The men laughed and again called my brother a pussy. I told them that we were not pussies, as I had jumped from this spot before, but that it was not safe to do it in the dark. The men then formed a half circle around us, and one of the men then said, I want to see, show us that you're an old bunch of pussies. I screamed at them that it was too dangerous at night and that during the day was dangerous enough. I told them that there are many rocks that you have to avoid and that if you did not jump correctly that the jump could kill you. I pleaded and pleaded. The men just laughed and took a few steps closer to us. I was beyond scared and could hear my heart beating through my ears. My brother by this point was crying loudly and saying things that I could not understand. He was beyond terrified and so was I. I grabbed his hand and told him that we needed to get away from these men as we were in great danger. I told him that I had jumped off here before into the water and knew where to jump and that if he jumped with me that we would be okay. I told him that I would use my flashlight to help guide us and that I would tell him where to put his feet and how far to jump. The men laughed at us as we had our conversation and showed zero humanity or pity. I held my brother's hand and placed his feet with my hand onto a specific place on the rock ledge where I remembered jumping from the last time I was there three months before. I explained to him that I knew he was scared and so was I but that we needed to jump as far as we can and slightly to the right otherwise we could hit the rocks. He was shaking, crying, and kept telling me that he couldn't do it. He then urinated on the floor. The men laughed and laughed, and kept saying they couldn't believe how big of pussies we were. I then told my brother we needed to jump now, and that he would be okay if he listened to me. I told him that after we jumped, that we would swim to the shore on the right, and would hide in the bushes until daybreak, and would go for help then. I then grabbed his hand, tightly, and told him, that when we hit the water, he needed to tuck his arms and legs in so that they would not get hurt from the impact of the water and instructed him that he needed to swim hard to the surface as we would sink pretty far down due to the height we were jumping from. I pulled him hard with me to ensure that he would be safe from the rocks below and that he jumped far enough out. We fell for what seemed like for a minute but was only a few seconds in reality. My brother yelled all the way down in a way that I had never heard from another human being before. Terror, dread, and fear of imminent death reverberated from his voice. I felt helpless and almost forgot where we were for those few seconds. Then, we hit the water. And as soon as we hit, I lost my grip on my brother's hand, but did hear a second impact in the water. I swam up towards the surface with all my energy and took a deep breath. I then listened for my brother to surface and heard nothing. I panicked and dove down into the water to try and grab him. Just as I dove, I felt his leg brush against my hand and realized that he was about to surface. I swam up again and heard my brother. He was crying and kept saying that his arm hit a rock and that he could not feel it. The men above were laughing again and I heard one of them say, they fucking made it, those pussies. I then heard objects splashing in the water around us and realized that they were throwing beer bottles or rocks or some other hard object at us. I quickly grabbed my brother by his shirt and helped him swim to the nearby shore from my memory of where it was. The whole time we swam, many objects landed dangerously close to us and I felt that if any had hit us, 
and it would have caused death or great bodily harm to us, especially if we were hit in the head. My flashlight had been lost in the fall, and we were in complete darkness. We reached the water's edge and I pulled my brother to the shore. Objects continued to rain down around us, and we could hear the men yelling and laughing. I told my brother that we needed to run. He was crying and was holding his injured arm that he still could not feel or use. It had a deep cut around the elbow, and even with just the starlight, we could see that it was a serious injury. We stumbled down the tree line and began making our way through the darkness to one of the main trails, whose location I remembered from the past memory. We fell again and again and were cut by branches and rocks all over our bodies as we wandered about down the overgrown trail. Everything in my body told me to keep going and to get as far away from these men as we could. We walked for many minutes until we could no longer hear the men and then we waited. I wrapped my brother's arm with my shirt and told him that it was over and that all we had to do was wait until morning for help. We sat in that spot all night and my brother cried and shook for hours. I just put my arm around him and patted his head as I did when we were children whenever he had a panic attack and our parents were not around. At daybreak, we could finally see the severity of his injuries. He had a deep gash in his arm and his shoulder was obviously dislocated. I helped him hike up the nearby trail and we walked all the way back to the base camp ranger station. We explained what happened to the rangers and they sent two armed officers to go and investigate the location. My brother was sent to a nearby hospital for treatment and I joined him on the ambulance ride over. The rangers and police never found the men but did retrieve most of our gear. The scary thing about this incident is that the same week, two teenage boys were found dead at the bottom of the gorge jumping area and their group had encountered a group of people as we did at their camping location with similar machete objects who chased them off their camping spot. I'm glad to be alive and my brother and I have never gone camping again alone or have ever been back to that specific location. All we have left from the incident are the scars on my brother's arm, a hospital bill and a lot of trauma. An article of the death of the two teenage boys is below in the description. I can only hope that their deaths were accidents as the authorities ruled. I did not find out about their deaths until seven years after, but was horrified about the similar circumstances and timing of the two events. At about 8pm last night, I was walking with a friend of mine, Sally, about a mile to the closest cafe. We're both girls in our early 20s, neither of us own cars. Sally didn't have her Opal card, which is this Aussie version of an Oyster card if you know what that is, basically an automatic ticketing system for public transport. So walking was our only option. It's summer over here, so it was still fairly well lit and we were walking down main roads so we weren't too concerned. We finally arrived at this cafe and sat down. I was paying, but I only had my credit card, and sure enough, it was cash only. Sally was on the phone when I got back from the counter, so I just gestured for her to stay put and guard the spot while I went to get cash out. This is my home suburb, so I know there is no ATMs around, and my best bet is a gas station about a block away. I'm doing a light jog so I don't keep Sally waiting, when a balding, sweating guy, probably in his late 40s with a tank top and no shoes, comes pacing behind me as I pass the corner of the block. He walked behind me for about 100 meters. I didn't really think much of it, the gas station was the next building along, it seemed like he had just come out of a nice suburban house along the street and it wasn't the witching hour, so... I just assumed he was going to the gas station like me. He didn't even cross my mind as I entered the tiny convenience store, nor did he follow me in. In my peripheral, I saw him walk past the door and out of sight. I looked for an ATM that they sometimes have inside. No such luck. So I go up to this man in his 30s at the desk and reluctantly ask if they're able to do cash out. He smiles and says, Of course. And then asks, is he with you? I have no idea who he's talking about at first, and then he points to the man from earlier, pacing around outside the store. Keep in mind, 
He didn't look at all menacing. He wasn't going back and forth just outside the door. He was drifting in the space outside, from the pavement to the gas pumps to the storefront seemingly aimlessly. I assumed he was on drugs. I tell the clerk, No, not thinking much of it at all. He says, Oh, he was staring at you before. I thought he might have been your dad or something. I laugh it off. I honestly wasn't concerned at all. He was still ambling around outside, and I couldn't imagine him having a fixed gaze on anything. I thank the clerk for the cash, but before I turn away to leave, he says, Just wait and see if he leaves first. We wait for a few minutes in silence, and the guy begins to pace back and forth directly against the front wall of the store, looking straight ahead and never into the store. It still looked like the man was just on a drug-induced amble and seemed harmless. Not once did I catch his gaze, so I figured it would be safe to just slip out the door and walk back to the cafe in the fairly bright light of dusk, especially since Sally was texting me at this point asking, where are you? I thank the guy at the desk once again for his concern, assure him that I don't know the guy and I'm not involved in some weird scheme to rob the store and head for the door. The clerk asks if I want him to walk out with me. I say that I should be alright and began walking away from the block. As I leave the store, the drifting man stops pacing and makes a beeline for me from the end of the building. I seriously didn't think much of the guy at all up until this point, but for the first time, he was briskly walking in a straight line towards me. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I start power walking so that he doesn't think that I'm actively trying to escape from him, still trying to convince myself that I'm just being paranoid and should be more casual. I don't look behind me to see how close he is. I've reached the pavement on the other side of the gas pumps when I hear the clerk run outside. He's yelling at me. Go, run, run. I make a break for it, looking over my shoulder. He's grabbed the man by his shoulders from behind. The boarding man isn't even glancing behind him or trying to escape. He's just watching me run away. That's pretty much the end of the story, folks. I keep running until I've crossed the road and then I turn around, standing still. The clerk is still just holding onto the odd staring man. The clerk and I are just looking at each other in bewilderment, not really knowing what to do. He makes a hand gesture for me to go and I gesture my thanks. I got back to Sally with the cash and bought food before walking back home a different way. Overall, odd guy at the gas station, let's not meet. Nice gas station attendant who went well out of his way to help my naive self. I'm definitely glad we met. This incident happened a few years ago when I was a college student in Baltimore, Maryland. I had found a nice third floor apartment with two friends in a beautiful old building. Being young and naive, we'd often leave the door to our apartment unlocked while we were home assuming that the building's locking entrance door would do the trick. Of course, unless all the tenants made sure to close it entirely on their way out, that door could remain just ajar enough to not lock. Anyone who's lived in a not so great area of a city probably knows where this is going. It was really early in the morning and my housemate had just left for work. I was fast asleep in bed. I'm a small person and during the winter, I like to cocoon myself head to toe in a lot of thick comforters. Anyways, the first thing I remember is waking up, super groggy, to the sound of somebody in my room. It was pretty dark, but I could make out the tall, slim figure of a person who was sort of drifting around by the side of my bedroom. In my half-asleep state, I assumed that it was my housemate. We were close and often would borrow things, an umbrella, a pen, etc. from each other freely, so I figured they were just poking around for something. I promptly emerged from the blanket cocoon and asked in my infamous morning person super cheerful voice, Can I help you find anything, babe? The figure turned and jumped about a foot in the air. I realized pretty quickly and with a sinking feeling that it was not my flatmate, but instead some tall man I'd never seen in my life. I then realized he didn't even know that I was in the bedroom or the apartment at all. He muttered something, I think, about how he thought this was his friend's apartment. 
I just kind of stared, bewildered, and told him, Oh no, sorry, this is my apartment. It was very surreal, and I don't think I fully realized at that point that I was being robbed. With that, he turned and pretty much bolted out through the living room, and I learned about 10 minutes later that he'd grabbed my laptop on his way out, so at least he managed to find something. Suffice to say, lesson learned. We kept all doors to the place locked at all times from that day forward. My friends and I still laugh about it, but I can't help but think about how it could have been a much worse situation if A. It wasn't just some guy committing a crime of opportunity and B. I hadn't scared him off with my skills as the world's most considerate home invasion hostess. A few years ago, my brother-in-law bought another apartment complex in Florida. He owns a few apartment complexes in West Palm Beach, Miami, etc. So when he told me he bought another one and wanted me to manage it, I figured why the hell not. I had just graduated college with my degree and planned to go to get my masters, so I figured I could manage his place and do graduate school. When he booked my flight to Orlando, I was stoked, heck yes. I love Disney and I dreamed about buying a year pass and checking out all the neat parks. Then when I got there, we drove out of Orlando and I had a bad feeling. He bought the apartments in a town called Leesburg. It's only an hour or so from Orlando. It's if a biker town and a retirement community had a baby. I was a little disappointed that I was an hour from Orlando with its nightlife, clubs and whatnot. I made it work though and soon settled into life, managing a small apartment complex. I had my own one bedroom apartment in the corner and then there were 10 other tenants. Most were older folks, snowbirds and retirees that spent their days golfing and swimming in the pool we had. There were two military families, one with small kids. Then there was Andy. Andy was an enormous man. I'm a pretty big guy, 6 foot 4, 250 pounds, but he was at least 6 foot 6 and 400 plus pounds. He walked with a cane and had long black hair he put in a ponytail. He worked from home, or so he said, but rumor was he was on disability after a horrible work accident. I really didn't care. He paid his rent on time, he was quiet and kept to himself. I was only in his place once when his AC cut out, and to my surprise, he was pretty neat, no food containers or pizza boxes, beer cans etc that I expected a big guy like him to leave laying out. Things in our complex went pretty good for the next year, until one night in November. It was raining, like he always does in Florida, and it was about midnight when someone rang my doorbell. I looked out and saw one of my tenants, Joseph. Joe was one of my retirees who retired to Florida to, in his words, play golf and drink beer. Normally he was all smiles and jokes but that night, his face was pale and he looked frightened. I hate to bother you Sam but something ain't right with Andy. I put my jacket on and followed him to his apartment since Andy was his neighbour. He put his finger to his lip and motioned for me to listen. I put my ear up to the door and heard Andy fighting with someone. It sounded like whoever he was fighting with was throwing things. I was taken aback as he never had a guest over ever in the entire year that he lived there. So I knocked and heard him stomp over to the door and open it. He looked. Normally he was well dressed, put together and like I said he wasn't a messy guy at all. But he answered in a shirt that had grease stains, his hair was limp and greasy and he smelt like B.O. I peered in behind him and saw his place was a disaster. I asked if everything was okay. He was irritated and told me that it was and pretty much shut the door in my face. I sent Joe back into his place, told him to let me know if he heard anything else and went to bed. The next morning I decided to pay Andy a visit, see if he was okay and so I went by his place and knocked. No answer. So I decided I would try back later. I got busy doing some other things and then forgot all about it. December rolls around and I'm starting to get the monthly rent checks. 
none from Andy. That got me a bit worried as he was always on time with his checks. So I knocked on his door. Nothing. I knocked again. And I heard grunting and moaning. Now, I should have called the police first, but I didn't. I opened the door with my keyring and was hit with the foulest smell ever. It smelled like piss, shit, vomit and B.O. all rolled into one nasty smell. The walls were streaked with what I assume was shit and the place was trashed. I start calling for Andy while dialing 911 and I hear the moaning from the back bedroom. I can never unsee what I saw, ever. To this day, I get flashbacks. Andy was naked and laying on the floor of his room on some dirty clothes. He was covered in his own shit and piss and there was piles of vomit on the carpet. That was bad, but what shocked me the most was that he was covered in bites, human bites all over his arms, legs, and they were starting to smell with infection. He was also bleeding from his rectum and I wondered who attacked him. Was it the woman we heard him fighting with? I didn't get my answers until a few days after. He had been rushed to the hospital and was fighting for his life in the ICU. The doctors talked to his sister who turned out to be his medical guardian and things slowly came into place. Turns out, Andy did that to himself. He suffered from multiple mental disorders. He stopped taking his medications in the months before November and there was no other person. That night, he was arguing with himself. Those bites, he inflicted himself the bleeding in his rectum from inserting a foreign object in there and doing so much damage it ruptured his internal organs. He ended up pulling through and went home to live with his sister. I had the task of cleaning his apartment and what I found while cleaning pretty much freaks me out as much as finding him. He had a shoebox full of cutouts from magazines, old family photos and even photos he obviously took of the residents of the apartments, including myself. All of the eyes were burnt out with cigarettes, and on some of them, X's were put over the mouths. I'm not sure if that was part of his mental decline, or if he was always that creepy, and I never noticed it. I was 19 years old when this happened and incarcerated in an Ohio penitentiary at the time. I'm now a 30 year old man with a wife, kids, normal job, so sharing this story isn't really something I ever get the chance to do, as prison stories aren't really a great impression on anyone. First, if you think the stories about rape or gay sex in prison are exaggerated or myths, you would be completely wrong and it's most definitely a thing. I was never a victim of rape nor did I ever feel like my butt virginity was in jeopardy. However, I did get placed in some really awkward situations. For example, after a few days of being in general population, guys will start hitting on you. And I'm not talking about, I lost my number, can I have yours? No, one of the nicest ways I was hit on was by a guy who was bent over at a picnic table in the yard, you know, knees on the bench and elbows on the table, looked back at me and said, You ready for some pussy yet, Robbie? As he smiled while having his butt at me. Also, if a guy introduces himself as Sweet Pussy Jim, he's most likely a hooker offering his services to you. So, I had been in general population for about a week when I met him, Gary. I had knew enough by this point that just by the way he acted, he was one of the sisters. I had also learned not to talk with these guys unless you wanted to be on the other people's radar as a potential sister. Gary was staring at me and I was doing my best not to make eye contact and try to avoid any awkward situation. He didn't care though. He came up to me and said, Do you want to see my baby? I guess I thought he was referring to his boyfriend so I just smiled and said, Nah, I'm good. Gary says, Please come see my baby. Again, I say, I'm good man, thanks. Gary walks away pissed off talking to himself and I'm just sitting there wondering what the fuck was that dude talking about. 
About 15 minutes pass. And here comes Gary again. Do you want to see my baby? And I quickly tell him no for the third time. Again, he walks off mumbling and shaking his head. A few more minutes go by, and here comes Gary again. Do you want to see my baby? I tell him. Listen man, I really don't want to meet your baby. I'm good. I'm still pretty calm at this point, and knowing that this dude was more than likely someone's girl, I really didn't want to throw the first punch and have to deal with the consequences from it. Well, this routine goes on for the rest of the day. Gary would come to me a couple of times each hour and ask me, Do you want to see my baby? And every time I would say, No, and he would just walk off shaking his head and mumbling some shit. Towards the end of the day I had been asked, Do you want to see my baby? Probably close to 50 times. And to be honest, I was starting to get curious. I had also noticed that it seemed like Gary was cycling between about five different guys and asking us all if we wanted to see his baby. I started to figure out it wasn't who was his baby, but rather what was his baby. I was genuinely curious at that point, and for some reason, I guess I thought his baby was going to be some drawing or craft of an actual baby. I'll tell you now. It wasn't either of those, and if you're thinking it's his dick, well, that wasn't either. I figured, fuck it. Here comes Gary. Do you want to see my baby? I said. How about this? Will you leave me the fuck alone if I come and see your baby? Gary gets excited and says, Yeah, 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 come, come look at my baby. So, against my better judgement, I follow Gary to his bunk. He pulls a shoebox out from underneath his rack. He's doing it very slow and gentle as if he's trying not to wake his baby up. Now, he's cradling the shoebox in his left arm, rocking it and begins to take the lid off. As he's taking the lid off, he looks at me, smiles and says, Shh, it's a girl. Her name's Julie. I wasn't ready. Oh man, what the f- Fuck, dude. I gagged and dry heaved and walked away. And what Gary revealed to me as his baby was a humongous turd. Probably about 7 to 9 inches long with a pink bow wrapped around it. Apparently, Gary had a bowel movement during sex the night before and considered it as his baby girl. He did, however, keep his word and never spoke another word to me again after that. Gary, I hope you're in a better place now, but this memory still pops up in my head every now and again, and I truly hope none of us ever have to meet you or your baby.